Good evening. I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, the government narrows the amount of pandemic financial support and who can get it. I don't know what I'm going to do now that it's ending. What it means for Canadians and pandemic politics. At issue is here. Also tonight, Saskatchewan's deepening ICU crisis. What we're seeing is the system really collapsing. New calls for action before things get even worse. The Queen spends a night in hospital. There's caution and concern. The fact that she was there for a very temporary time and then was apparently back at work today is a very positive sign. And France travels to Yukon to give a Canadian veteran its highest honour. I felt very badly for all the people, France and Belgium and Holland. A new medal for long ago valour. This is The National. In the alarming first days of the pandemic, when Canada went into lockdown, federal wage and rent subsidies became a lifeline for many. Now, a year and a half later, the federal government says it is time for that help to shift. So it's ending some broad supports like the Canada Recovery Benefit and starting more targeted ones. The goal to help businesses and workers next through the next phase of the pandemic. So David Cochran lays out what's in, what's out, and those who critics say are being left behind. The pandemic isn't yet over, but the days of historic pandemic spending are nearing the end. The existing income and business support programs will end on October 23rd. So ending on Saturday are the Canada Recovery Benefit, the wage subsidy, the rent subsidy. Replacing them on Sunday, the Tourism and Hospitality Recovery Program, which offers wage and rent subsidies of up to 75% to businesses in those sectors who lose at least 40% of their income. And the hardest hit business recovery program with wage and rent subsidies of up to 50% for other businesses who lose at least 50% of their income. Freeland hopes this is the final aid package. It comes with a price tag of $7.4 billion. That compares to the $289 billion we have spent on income and business supports since the start of the pandemic. But that lower price tag means lower levels of support, with subsidies as low as 10% and many small businesses on the outside looking in. So a business that has seen their revenues drop by a third is on its own. They don't have any support from Ottawa whatsoever. Well, the government's decided to leave a lot of people in the cold. The New Democrats say the government is scrapping the CERB too soon. There will be income support for people under government-imposed lockdowns, but not for anyone else. It's important to have a transition plan, and just folding up shop and walking away isn't a transition plan. The best possible support for a Canadian is actually a job, and that's what these programs are designed to really promote. Freeland calls this the final pivot, saying that with vaccines widely available and lockdowns largely over, it's time to transition from expensive national programs to cheaper targeted ones. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. So tonight, those changes are worrying some businesses and workers who are about to have their federal support slashed. And as Jacqueline Hansen shows us, for them, the consequences are serious. Christine Eilat is back to work as an usher at several theaters. Pre-pandemic, she worked 45 hours a week. Now she's lucky to get 10. I'm averaging approximately 143.50 a week income. She's been relying on the Canada Recovery Benefit to help pay her basic bills. I don't know what I'm going to do now that it's ending. I'm, I'm totally at a loss right now. Data from mid-September shows about 800,000 Canadians still receiving the CRB. That's down from more than 1.2 million in January. Now Canadians will only be eligible for support if their work is affected by a public health lockdown. We're now in a new phase, one that is very different from the darkest days in our fight against COVID. As of September, all the jobs lost at the start of the pandemic have been gained back. But compared to February 2020, more Canadians are working fewer hours and the number of long-term unemployed has also jumped. The pandemic isn't over. This economist says cutting off support for individuals isn't the answer. The focus right now has to be on creating jobs, not on reinstilling some kind of tough love 
work ethic. Uh, it's not the work ethic that's the problem. It's a shortage of jobs and a shortage of hours. But the new targeted business support also announced today isn't going to help this chain of 27 restaurants bring back more workers. We can't afford to be able to hire them back. Revenue is down 30% compared to two years ago, but the new tourism support, which includes restaurants, requires a drop of 40. We are likely to have to close probably between three and five of our restaurants. Eilat is hopeful that eventually, as restrictions lift, her hours will increase and she can go back to fully supporting herself. I love what I do. I love our customers. I love my employers. I don't want to leave. Jacqueline Hansen, CBC News, Toronto. And some travel news tonight. The federal government has lifted its blanket warning against all non-essential travel outside of Canada. Earlier today, it said that provincial or territorial proofs of vaccination should be used internationally as well. We are very confident that this proof of vaccination certificate uh, that will be uh, federally approved, uh, issued by the provinces with the uh, health information for Canadians, uh, is going to be accepted. So officials say all provinces and territories have agreed to a pan-Canadian document format, which includes a Government of Canada logo, and most have already issued them. It will still be up to foreign governments to accept them or not. And the federal government announced Pfizer will ship 2.9 million doses of COVID-19 vaccine for children as soon as Health Canada approves it for kids age 5 to 11. That is enough doses for all of them. Now today, CBC Radio Canada employees were given a deadline of December the 1st to get vaccinated against COVID. The consequences of failing to do so for anyone without an exemption haven't been finalized. Let's turn to an increasingly dire situation in Saskatchewan. Almost one in five of its total COVID-19 deaths have come in the last month alone. Hospitals are buckling under the strain and critically ill patients are being sent out of province for care. Bonnie Allen takes us inside the crisis tonight. Doctors inside this Saskatoon hospital say it doesn't look like a disaster zone, but with COVID patients stuffed in a laundry room and a children's ward, it is one. ICU doctor Jeremy Katolka is on his first day off in a month. You worry that you start to slip and miss things and, and make mistakes that, that could harm patients. So that's really, that's the worst of it for me. Three of Katolka's patients were sent to Ontario this week, relieving some pressure, but not enough. There are 76 COVID patients in Saskatchewan ICUs. New modeling suggests that could more than triple by January if there are no additional public health measures or vaccine boosters. I am really deeply concerned for the citizens of Saskatchewan and what will happen if more public health measures aren't put in place. The, model... the president of the Canadian Medical Association says it's time to stop asking the government nicely. I think what we're seeing is the system in Saskatchewan really collapsing. I have no shame in pleading to the public that we've gone so far. Saskatchewan's chief medical health officer broke down in tears yesterday, but also came under fire over whether he has recommended private gathering limits. The government won't implement them. New cases seem to be trending down, but testing has dropped too. I think it's really uh, somewhat nonsensical that we have a province that is really the epicenter of COVID-19 in the nation right now have some of the um, lowest level of public health restrictions. The situation is unsafe in the ICUs right now with the number of patients we're seeing and we're not able to offer necessary health services like surgeries. Saskatchewan has already sent six ICU patients to Ontario and today confirmed it will send another three by Sunday. The province has also asked the federal government to send health care workers. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. A new warning today about COVID-19. The World Health Organization said the pandemic will drag on much longer than it needs to well into 2022 if poorer countries aren't provided with more vaccine and fast. To have the vaccines available in one half of the world and yet to deny them to the other half of the world is one of the greatest international public policy failures imaginable. The WHO is calling on the world's richest countries to immediately live up to their vaccine donation commitments. More than a billion doses had been pledged to developing countries, 
but just an eighth of that has been delivered. In wealthy nations, the concern isn't a lack of vaccines, but the resumption of pre-pandemic behavior. Take the surge of cases in the UK. More than 50,000 new infections announced just today, the most in months. As Margaret Evans reports, even that grim record is not enough to trigger change. How do you learn to live with a virus when it's still claiming lives? It's a question many in Britain are asking after the government rejected calls from scientists and health bodies to reintroduce COVID measures like wearing masks indoors. The UK health minister says the strategy is to build a vaccine wall, encouraging those eligible to get booster shots. We're looking closely at the data and we won't be implementing our plan B of contingency measures at this point. Critics are asking, if not now, then when? Hospitalizations are increasing, deaths are increasing, almost a thousand people a week. Susan Mickey is part of a government advisory body speaking here personally. I would say it's a failure of leadership. Uh, what has happened time and time again is one rule for us and one rule for you. So we're having leading ministers today saying, oh no, we're not going to be wearing masks indoors in crowded places because we all know each other. The UK is an outlier compared to its former partners in the European Union. On average, there are nearly 45,000 new COVID infections here every day. Compare that to France, where the number is less than 5,000. Earlier this month, a British parliamentary report said that delays in acting early on resulted in tens of thousands of preventable deaths. Another kind of wall, this one filled with hearts dedicated to those who've died of COVID-19. Safiya Na lost her father in February. We didn't learn from our mistakes the first time um, after the first wave. And had we done that, I really believe my dad would still be alive. Her fear now is that history will repeat. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Well, a man has been charged in the UK in the killing of Sir David Amos. The British MP was stabbed to death while meeting voters last week. A 25-year-old appeared in court today on charges of murder and of preparing a terrorist act. Prosecutors told the court he was an ISIS supporter who, for years, had planned to kill an MP. Queen Elizabeth is said to be in good spirits today after spending Wednesday night in hospital. Now, few details are known, but as Thomas Dagla shows us, there is reason for at least some concern for a monarch who is still working hard at 95. Back between the walls of Windsor Castle, the Queen is spending the night at home after an unpublicized trip to the hospital yesterday and with increasing attention on the 95-year-old's health. The fact that she was there for a very temporary time and, and was able to be discharged home and then was apparently back at work today is a very positive sign. A palace spokesperson saying only following medical advice to rest for a few days, the Queen attended hospital on Wednesday afternoon for some preliminary investigations, returning to Windsor Castle at lunchtime today and remains in good spirits. If there are whispers of concern for Elizabeth's health, the family is keeping it to themselves. With Prince Charles today attending a charity event at St. James's Palace. As COVID restrictions ease, the Queen has been carrying out more public duties in person, planting a tree for the cameras. The Wales Act 2017. Opening the Welsh Parliament last week. And just this past Tuesday at Windsor Castle, hosting business leaders and smiling all along. It may be that she just overdid it. I think we're going to see more of this. Uh, simply not so much because the Queen's health may deteriorate. Officials have to be more cautious. Bear in mind, though, she has been showing signs of decline, using a walking stick in public, canceling a trip to Northern Ireland on doctor's advice, now, an overnight stay at King Edward VII's hospital for the first time in years, the same place her late husband, Prince Philip, was treated this year. By this afternoon, she was back at her desk and working, just as she has been for a lifetime. A symbol of strength and endurance for generations, the Queen is following doctor's orders just as any 95-year-old would. Thomas Dagg, CBC News, Toronto. 
In Haiti, the leader of the gang police say kidnapped 17 missionaries has threatened to kill them if he doesn't get what he wants. One Canadian and 16 Americans were abducted over the weekend. The gang is demanding one million U.S. dollars per person. The missionary group held a news conference earlier with a call for prayer. We are inviting believers from all around the world to join us in praying for our workers, our loved ones that are being held hostage in Haiti. He also says the Canadian comes from a community in Ontario. When he campaigned to lead Alberta, Jason Kenney targeted foreign-funded groups, accusing them of hurting the province's energy industry. After his party won, he commissioned an inquiry to get to the bottom of it. The results were made public today, and critics say it amounts to a drop of oil in the bucket. Julia Wong has the details. They were stern words two years ago from Alberta Premier Jason Kenney. It will serve notice that Alberta will no longer allow hostile interest groups to dictate our economic destiny. The launch of an inquiry to dig up whether and how foreign money may be blocking oil and gas development. The Premier on a crusade, even pumping millions into a dedicated war room to fight back against energy critics. Fast forward to the noticeable absence of the Premier at the report's release, more than a year late and a million dollars over budget, and without the smoking gun the Alberta government was looking for. The report found $1.3 billion flowed into Canadian-based environmental initiatives between 2003 and 2019, but just 4% of that, $54 million, was earmarked for alleged anti-energy campaigns. Today, Alberta's energy minister stood firm. We've been put at a competitive disadvantage because of these foreign-funded campaigns, and I'm not okay with it, and I don't think Albertans are okay with that. But one environmental law expert says that outrage is unwarranted. There's just a real, like, in, irreconcilable tension between what the government would like the report to stand for and what it actually stands for. Environmental organization EcoJustice says Kenny invested a lot of time and rhetoric into an anti-Alberta narrative, but ended up with a report that found no wrongdoing. At the end of the day, what was the point? All we can say again, that it was a waste of time. As for what's next for the report, that is unclear. But one thing that's not, it's another blow for an already embattled premier. Julia Wong, CBC News, Edmonton. Recreational cannabis use was legalized three years ago now. And since then, one of its properties, CBD, has exploded in popularity. Unlike THC, it does not get you high, and it can be found in everything from bath bombs to dog treats. But our colleagues at Marketplace discovered hundreds of CBD products being sold illegally. Here's Stephen D'Souza. And then we do have tinctures, which are like oil droppers for stress, anxiety, insomnia. They operate right out in the open. Unlicensed stores selling CBD or cannabidiol, a cannabis extract that's touted as a wonder drug that some promise can heal without getting you high. So okay, whatever your body needs, whatever the situation uh, is, well, CBD will help that. It's like it can do anything, really. It's kind of like a superpower almost. But as our Marketplace hidden camera investigation shows, the products they're selling online and in stores and the health claims they're making are all illegal. And experts worry mislabeled ingredients and possible contaminants could be putting Canadians at risk. Canadians are buying these products, and in the absence of evidence, they are going by marketing claims. And that's a real problem. CBD is legal in Canada, but here, unlike the U.S., CBD is a controlled substance. That means only government-licensed retailers can legally sell it. That hasn't stopped the sale of illicit products, everything from oils and creams to gummies and pet products. And because CBD is a controlled substance, researchers, even Marketplace, can't legally test them. U.S. researchers found many similar products mislabeled or containing undisclosed THC. These products can be acquired by anyone in Canada with an internet connection and a, uh, you know, a credit card, but you can't actually test what all these people are using, which seems very counterintuitive. While CBD does show promise for treating a host of conditions, Experts say the price does add up, and more study is needed, including how CBD interacts with other drugs like opioids and blood thinners. 
It is not cheap. And yeah. let's remember, there's no utopia. I would say maybe one in three individuals might find benefit from this. In a statement to Marketplace, Health Canada wouldn't say if they'll remove CBD from the list of controlled substances. They said they are reviewing the laws around cannabis, but a report won't come until about 2023. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, Toronto. And you can tune in tomorrow night for the full results of Marketplace's investigation. That's at 8 p.m., 8.30 in Newfoundland on CBC Television and GEM. Well, Donald Trump is launching a social media platform to compete against the tech giants that banned him. Coming up, the stock price is soaring, but Trump has tried this before. Plus... A fight is brewing over vaccine mandates, this time among MPs. There are people out there who think that just because they are members of parliament, they do not need to keep themselves, their loved ones, or their constituents safe. Rosie and Ad Issue are here with that and their thoughts on the upcoming cabinet and... The winning rendition. We'll tell you about the Canadian who received a prestigious award playing one of the greats. We're back in two. Authorities in the U.S. have confirmed the human remains found in Florida yesterday were, in fact, Brian Laundries. He had been the only person of interest in the death of his fiancée, Gabby Petito. Her remains were found in Wyoming a month ago. After nine months of social media exile for his role in the January 6th Capitol attack, former U.S. President Donald Trump is launching his own social media platform. Trump says Truth Social will rival tech giants Facebook and Twitter that banned him permanently earlier this year. He'll have a long way to go on that score, but shares of the digital company he's partnering with skyrocketed 400%. The announcement came just before Congress voted to approve criminal contempt charges against Trump's former advisor, Steve Bannon, for defying a subpoena from the January 6th committee. The yeas are 229, the nays are 202, the resolution is adopted. Bannon had refused to appear before the committee or to hand over documents. The matter now moves to the U.S. Justice Department. It will decide whether to prosecute. Well, every year, the number of Canadian veterans of the Second World War gets smaller. But gratitude for their courage lives on here and abroad. In fact, France is determined to find every living Canadian veteran who fought on its shores and to thank them in person. This week, they located one of Yukon's only living veterans. Anna Demeray was there. At just 20 years old, Lance Corporal Joseph Novak was willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. And now, decades later, France's highest honor is pinned to his chest by a representative of France. With the powers invested in me, I knight you with the Legion of Honor. It's my great pleasure and it's a great honor for me. Novak is one of just over 20,000 living Canadian veterans who served in World War II. He landed on Juneau Beach a few days after D-Day and saw the fighting on the front lines of the Battle of Normandy. Despite all the suffering he saw on the front lines, he felt like he needed to be there. I felt it was my duty to join the Canadian Army to help the liberation of the occupied country after so many years. I was still happy to be living in Canada, a free country where you could go where you want, do what you want, say what you want. And I felt very badly for all the people, France and Belgium and Holland. The French government is actively looking for more Canadians like Novak. They've given out over a thousand of these medals already to veterans across the country. A way to thank them before it's too late. As the veterans get older, it's important for France to recognize their sacrifice. It's also important to create an example for the younger generation. I regret the fact that I won't be around to keep reminders going continually. Novak wants Canadians to remember their veterans, not just on Remembrance Day. He's dedicating his medal to all those who lost their lives in the war and who will never get to feel the weight of that star on their chest. Anna Demarest, CBC News, Whitehorse. 
Coming up, Rosie is here with that issue. Hi, Rosie. Hey, Adrian. Tonight, we're going to talk about those vaccine mandates for MPs. It will be extremely important that everyone be vaccinated when the House returns. Plus, what you need to know ahead of next week's cabinet swearing in ceremony. Chantal, Andrew, Althea, and Elamin will join all of us right after the break. federal government is ending several of its pandemic support programs in just a few days, but billions will be spent on new, more targeted measures. Our emergency support measures were always designed to be temporary, to get us through the crisis. Thankfully, as the Prime Minister has just pointed out, we're now in a new phase. A new phase where vaccine passports and mandates are a reality, including for MPs. Unprecedented measures being unveiled just days before a new cabinet is sworn in. So is this the right kind of financial transition plan? And what message does next week's cabinet need to send? It's Thursday. I'm here with that issue. Chantal Hebert, Andrew Coyne, Althea Raj, and Elamine abdul Mahmoud. Nice to see everybody. Let, let's start with um, today's announcement. These supports sort of winding down, transforming, becoming more targeted. Andrew, I'll start with you. Is this what had to be done? Are they doing it the right way? Yeah, I mean, it's time. Uh, I might even say about time. We're more than 18 months from the peak of the pandemic. Uh, employment is back to its pre-pandemic levels. Um, and we've got to, to both in the reality and in the signals that we send show that we're coming to grips with the size of the deficit and the debt, the accumulating debt, uh, and indeed the money creation that the Bank of Canada purchases that have been going to finance that. I mean, it's coincidental, perhaps, that it comes out right after we hear that inflation has is, is jumped to 4.4%. Uh, but we need to be both, in, as I say, in substance and in, and in perception, showing that we're going to get a control of our deficits and debts and, and keep inflation under control. And this is part of, the, it seems to me, part of that as well. Um, are, are you surprised, Chantal, that it took this long to get to this point? Because there were, I mean, there are businesses, yes, calling for it to continue, but there are also businesses saying we can't find anyone to work for us. Uh, no, I am not surprised. And what is not a coincidence is that it comes after the prime minister has had a talk with the opposition leaders, uh, because whatever you do, you do want to be on some fairly consensual ground. Uh, and he is. Uh, the, the conservatives, uh, the Bloc Québécois, had both called for a more targeted approach, uh, and that is what they're getting. So... Yes, it comes the day before the, the deadline, but I don't think it could have happened uh, a lot before that time. Althea? I think so that it makes a good point about calling the opposition leaders. I think it's interesting, though, that the Liberals actually did not, Prime Minister's office did not consult his own caucus. Um, you know, the Liberals actually haven't had a real caucus meeting yet. And so to come forward after you've campaigned saying, you know, we will continue to have your back during COVID and to give people two days notice uh, instead of extending them for a four-week period and then announcing what your transition plan is going to be, I think um, will leave a bad taste in some people's mouth. I think the NDP is outraged mm -hmm. about this decision and not uh, without some good arguments on their side. Uh, Elamine, your thoughts on this? I mean, listen, plenty of the economists I know are concerned about inflation, but they're more concerned about wage losses. And like, yes, the, the Stats Canada number that jobs are back to where they were, you know, pre-pandemic is uh, an encouraging stat. But when you dig into the stat, it's actually a little bit discouraging because of where what sectors um, have sort of done that heavy lifting. Government is certainly doing fine. An administration is certainly doing fine. Um, but uh, if, if, as anyone would know, if you're just walking down the street, you see every restaurant has a hiring sign. Yeah. Um, you, you know, the, the food sector is not back. Um, tourism is, you know, taking a long time to recover. So these measures couldn't just kind of be pulled away because even if, as you're worried about that inflation um, increasing, you also have to worry about the fact that a lot of people still have not gone back into those sectors and those sectors are worried about their future. OK, let, let's look ahead to the cabinet swearing in on Tuesday. I'm not going to make you guess who's going where. I mean, if, if you think you know, <laughs> go ahead. But I, 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 I want to I want to ask you what this has to send in terms of a message for a government that cares a lot about messaging, uh, crafting a cabinet for the third time. Andrew, what 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 are you expecting? Well, cabinets have become uh, exercises in representation 
and to some extent they always were, but the, the math has become a lot more complicated the more dimensions in which you're trying to represent. And so the numbers have gotten progressively larger. We're now closing in on 40 members of cabinet. Most advanced democracies get by on a couple of dozen. Uh, so cabinets are used to show which constituencies and parts of the country the government wants to appeal to. And they're also useful to some extent to show what issues and, and agenda items are uh, of con particular concern to them. And we see that particularly in mandate letters that come out. Um, beyond that, it's, it's a numbers game. Um, and it's hard to attach too much importance to it since out of the last cabinet, you could probably name maybe half a dozen ministers who really had any, any uh, clout or say in the cabinet. Okay, Chantal? Well, uh, the point of this cabinet making is it tells you how important issues that uh, look important from the outside are to the prime minister. And I guess on that score, all eyes will be on who becomes the defense minister, for mm -hmm. instance. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you believe, uh, as many of us do, that this may be Justin Trudeau's last uh, term, then you start looking at uh, where people who might want to make a difference good enough to give them a leadership platform, end up in this shuffle. I've noticed that uh, it's, there's a Batman and Robin act on uh, Christian Freeland and Justin Trudeau. Mm -hmm. That's good and that's bad in the sense that uh, it's good because it gives her uh, a lot of space. It's bad because she gets to wear every decision this prime minister yeah. is going to be making. Yes, and, and, and every mistake potentially as well as things move forward. Althea, what, what are you looking for? Um, as usual, and I think Andrew kind of pointed out, you know, they're looking for regional representation. They're looking for ethnic diversity, religious diversity. But uh, this time around, I think there's other things that are going to play into the balance. One, there is the leadership race on the horizon. And the idea of giving people kind of an equal footing might be something we're going to see. The government's agenda, this is basically Justin Trudeau's chance to build himself a legacy. We know he wants to focus on health, reconciliation, climate change, so expect some big names to be moved into those areas or portfolios that are tangentially related. So we're hearing, you know, like natural resources is still going to be an important environmental yeah. portfolio and justice will be important to reconciliation. So and then there's the question of, you know, this is a government that doesn't really tend to um, I don't know how to say this politely, but they don't <laughs> seem to like older people so much around the cabinet table. And so I think you need to put a question mark around people like Lawrence McCauley, for example, who will be 75, or Carolyn Bennett, or even as Mark Garneau going to stay as, finance, as foreign affairs minister. One of the lessons learned, I'm told, from the PMO from 2019 is that you don't actually need to give somebody training wheels before you appoint them to cabinet. We saw that with Anita Nan, for example. Ch Chantal's face has gone through a lot of emotion as you were speaking, so I have to I have to go to her in a second, but I'll let El Amin weigh in first. I, I mean, I'm curious about the future of you might say again, like on the side of politeness, um, underperforming ministers, um, ministers like Minister Sejan, who you'd expect would be out of that portfolio, but maybe moved into something adjacent like um, Veterans Affairs, um, and then in that case, who would step up to fill that? Um, fill that place um, in defense. And like, I feel like Anita Anand is probably due for a promotion. After all, it was her procurement that helped the, you know, the liberals kind of win that, uh, win that election. Um, another underperforming minister I have to imagine is Stephen Gilbeau. Um, C-10 played well in Quebec, sure, but um, the way that that bill was communicated across the rest of the country, um, you, you might say that was not a success. Um, and I'm not sure that that, you know, warrants a promotion to um, a portfolio that fits his interests like environment. So that's, that's what I'm keeping an eye on. Okay, let Chantal gets the last word before we take a short break. Well, uh, I have to pick and choose. So uh, about this sudden uh, realization that people didn't need training wheels, are we talking about the prime minister who lost many people appointed without training wheels? Jane Philpott, Jody Wilson-Raybould, mm -hmm. Bill Morneau, over the course of his uh, time as prime minister, because I'm, I'm glad they suddenly discovered the virtues of two-wheeled bicycles. <laughs> okay, that's a good place to take a quick break. <laughs> we'll be back with another quick round of that issue right after this. We'll talk about what MPs will need to bring with them if they return to Parliament or when they do. Members of Parliament need to be fully vaccinated. The political response to this mandatory vaccination policy that's coming up.
it is puzzling to me that there are people out there who think that just because they are members of parliament, they do not need to keep themselves, their loved ones or their constituents safe when the vast majority of Canadians have done the right thing. That's the Prime Minister there on the mandatory vaccination policy for MPs, a move the Conservative Party uh, is opposing. So what happens next? Chantal, Andrew, Althea and Elamine back for another round. Althea, I'm going to start with you on this one. Um, so this would come into place uh, when Parliament returns at the end of November. What kind of position does this put the Conservatives in? This is basically a mess for Aaron O'Toole. This is an issue that uh, he did not win on during the last election. And I think really just shows the fact that he has no control over his caucus. This is not going to reflect positively on the Conservative Party. But perhaps the yardstick for Mr. O'Toole is not whether public opinion polls and people are in agreement with this policy that basically suggests that MPs should live by different rules than the rest of Canadians outside of the parliamentary precinct. But his focus is on winning the leadership vote at the next convention in 2023. And that's where his attention is because so many members of his caucus, I was told when I wrote my election rap mm -hmm. that about two dozen caucus yeah. members were unvaccinated. We, and, and to be fair, we don't actually know the, the number the Conservative Party hasn't disclosed. No, they uh, will not release who, it. Or, or the number of people. And some of the people are also just people who don't want to share personal information. Um, Chantal. But we also know that the majority on caucus is vaccinated uh, and yeah. uh, that there are MPs in there. We always talk about those who do not want to get vaccinated. But there are MPs who do not really want to take a hit on this. Yeah. Uh, and so it's easy enough to say, um, Aaron O'Toole, at some point we'll have to choose uh, between the outliers uh, and the others who want to move on and move on to something that is more logical. There is no doubt that if this comes to a vote in the House of Commons, the result will be the same as what happened at the Board of Internal Economy. And, and people have been saying, well, these things are done by consensus. Consensus does not equal unanimity. When you have three, and I'm assuming the two Green MPs, so four parties in agreement versus one, that's called a consensus and a strong one. Well, and, and I wonder if you have to stand up and vote on this issue, Andrew, how much more complicated does that become for the Conservatives too? Because presumably there would also be, as Chantal says, people who think you should be vaccinated or in, are in favor of that. Yeah, I mean, and, and as Chantal said, the vast majority of them are vaccinated and would stand up to vote as such, which might actually be good for the party to show that in fact, it's not yeah. terribly widespread within the party. Sure. But look, there's two different issues here. There's, there's what should be the rule and who should decide the rule. Uh, what should be the rule? It clearly, you know, any any claim that, that MPs are privileged extends to not being vaccinated uh, is preposterous. You can't take a loaded weapon into the House of Commons. You can't go in there in the nude. There's all kinds of conditions and rules uh, that that bind your 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 freedom of, of movement, uh, even as an MP. So th that's a, a, a red herring. I think there's a more legitimate issue of who should decide, and sure. and you know it, it should probably be by a vote of MPs. I'm not sure this was the hill to die on on that particular issue. Uh, it's going to end up with the same result as it would have been with the Board of Internal Economy, and as the point has been made, uh, only to the the only thing that's been achieved is to make the party look uh, foolish. A last last word to you, Elamine. I mean, I imagine that was the purpose, right? The purpose is to make the party look foolish, but also at the expense of kind of blowing up um, what is a microcosm of the larger division we're having out here outside of the House of Commons, which is this tension of, okay, how much freedom exactly should people who are not vaccinated <laughs> get? And increasingly, it seems like we're polarizing in this country into an answer of actually not much. Um, I just wonder about the long-term consequences of the prime minister hitting that polarization note. He hit it really hard during the election campaign. You thought that maybe he'd ease off of it by now, but no, they're going sort of full throttle on it. Um, and maybe they're guessing that this issue is not going to go away anytime soon, but it just seems like there is a cost eventually to sort of harvesting all of this uh, polarization and resentment. Okay, got to leave it there. Thank you to all four of you. You will all be back on Tuesday a couple of times through the special and then uh, that night on The National to appreciate it. And with that, now I'll throw things back to Adrian and Andrew in Toronto. Okay, thanks very much, Rosie. Coming up on The National, we remember a legend of the Stratford stage. I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth. We'll hear from friends who joined her on stage over the decades, plus... 
And with that rendition of Chopin, a Canadian is receiving international recognition. His story next. An incredible performance by Canadian Bruce Liu at Warsaw's famed Frederick Chopin piano competition last night. The 24-year-old was up against 11 other finalists from around the world. And it's no ordinary competition. The modest cash award of about $55,000 is one thing, but the real prize is the huge boost to the winner's international career. Oh, and did we mention, Liu took top prize. Alison Northcott has the story. Bruce Xiaoyu Liu's playing has been described as elegant and jaw-dropping, and it's earned him first prize in one of the world's most prestigious piano competitions. The winner of the competition is Bruce Xiaoyu Liu, Canada. Winning can be life-changing, opening doors to an international career. Being able to play Chopin in Warsaw is, is one of the best things you can imagine. Liu trained at the Montreal Conservatory of Music and the Université de Montréal. You can see the reaction in the hall. It's like a, a, a st standing ovation. I never heard like that. One of Liu's teachers is a previous first prize winner himself and says Liu's playing is filled with imagination and fantasy. A lot of charisma in his playing and with such kind of intensity that he keep the audience like a breathless. Part of Liu's development happened here at the Montreal Conservatory of Music. It's what you dream as a pianist, it's what you dream as a teacher too, you know, because we work in the background a lot, like, but we're there all the way, you know, through their development and their growth. When the competition was last held in 2015, Montrealer Charles Richard Amelin placed second. As much as it, it is taxing, uh, it's, it's, it's such a boost of energy and, and, and uh, adrenaline, you know, going through that experience. It brought him international attention and performances around the world. He continues to do concerts and teaches at this university. It's a great thing not only for, 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 for him, of course, but for the future of uh, think of mu music in Montreal and music education in Montreal. After the intensity of competition, Liu is looking forward to a break. So I'm happy to be finally be able to sleep and party. <laughs> and what an accomplishment he has to celebrate. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. Lovely. Next on The National, we pay tribute to a Canadian theatre legend. You could go away and be a soldier. Well, you could go. Hell. Remembering Martha Henry's extraordinary gifts in our moment tonight. I have bedimmed the noontide sun. There she is. Canada's theatre community is remembering one of its greatest tonight, Martha Henry. After enduring the trials and pain of cancer, the 83-year-old died early this morning in Stratford, Ontario. Tonight, her legacy is our moment. Born in Detroit, Henry made Canadian theatre her home and became a giant in the industry. I'll break my staff, bury it certain fathoms in the earth. Martha Henry was a mainstay at Ontario's Stratford Festival, where she made her very first appearance in 1962. She illuminated every character she inhabited. She illuminated every play that she directed. Uh, she brought out the best in everybody who was on that stage with her. She would go on to perform in more than 70 stage productions, directed 14 others, and had an illustrious career in film and television. Born that I had a single gray hair. Her performances are extraordinary. It's the kind of stuff that changes your life. Those who worked with her, though, say her greatest achievement may have been her influence on her peers. She dragged a lot of us along with her, and she insisted on pushing other people forward. She had just finished performing in the production of Three Tall Women, in which Henry played a dying woman, reflecting on the pain and pleasure of a long life. 12 days after the closing performance, Martha Henry died at home.
So her talent and her gravitas, undeniable. The accolades, too. I mean, five genies, three Geminis, seven honorary doctorates, along with becoming a companion of the Order of Canada and receiving the Governor General's Lifetime Achievement Award. And for those of you, like me, wishing you'd seen her in Three uh, Tall Women, Stratford was able to videotape it. They're working on finding a way to share it with the rest of us. That is The National for October 21st. Good night. Good night.